Hey everyone, welcome back to our series of short video lectures on AOAD on the topic of design at the detailed system level. Today we will be talking about the concepts of cohesion and coupling. First, let me introduce the concepts of cohesion. Cohesion describes how much a component contributes to a single purpose, which means that ideally all components in a well-structured object-oriented program should have only one responsibility. So what happens if a component has low cohesion, meaning that, say, a class serves many different purposes, but there are some distinct disadvantages. It becomes more complex. If there are changes to be made, they're harder to implement, and it is harder to reuse. In general, we want to have high cohesion within components. There are various types of cohesion. So for example, we can talk about operation cohesion, which asks the question, does an operation focus on a single task? In general, an operation should not do multiple unrelated tasks. There's also the concept of class cohesion that asks, is a class focused only on a single requirement? A class should not handle tasks that are not its responsibility. To illustrate these concepts, let's take a look at this example. We have a lesson class that has a name and a minimum GPA. And the rule states that students that have not obtained the minimum GPA are not allowed to take this lesson. Additionally, the lesson class is given the operation calculate GPA, which does the following. It first calculates the student's GPA. And if the student's GPA is greater than or equal to the minimum GPA, it will then add the student to this lesson. Now there are a couple of issues with this design. Firstly, notice that the calculate GPA operation does two things. It calculates the student's GPA and it registers the student to this lesson. This violates operation cohesion. Furthermore, the responsibility to calculate the student's GPA should not lie with the lesson. Instead, it should be the responsibility of the student. So this shows poor class cohesion. A better design would be like this, where the get GPA, let me get rid of that. Okay, the get GPA operation belongs to the student and the register operation belongs to the lesson. This design makes it a lot easier to maintain and code and update the system. Another type of cohesion is called specialization cohesion, which is an important concept in object-oriented programming. Specialization cohesion asks the question, do inheritances reflect an is-a relationship? For example, consider this design. We have an address class that has two subclasses, a person and a company. Now, because of inheritance, the person class does have the number, street 1, street 2, postal code, and country attributes. And therefore, if we wish to query about a person's address, that information is contained. However, semantically, we don't really think of a person as a type of address, or a company as a type of address. The alternative design, like this, makes a lot more sense. In this case, we say that a person lives at an address and a company is based at an address. Now, both the first and the second design works in terms of coding, but a second design makes a lot more sense. Now let's talk about coupling. While cohesion is talking about single components, coupling describes things to do with multiple components. In particular, it describes the, the degree of interconnectedness between components. If multiple components have high or tight coupling, then any changes to one component is likely to affect the others. Implementing a functionality may become more difficult because multiple components are interconnected. And therefore, if I want to implement something, I have to affect multiple components. And tightly coupled designs are harder to test because issues that arise, a bug that you detect, may be due to multiple components. 
So the general rule is we want to have low or loose coupling between components. Like cohesion, there are different aspects of coupling. Inheritance coupling refers to whether a subclass requires the features that are inherited from its superclass. So for example, we have a vehicle class that has the attributes name, description, service state, and maximum altitude. We also have the land vehicle class, which is a subclass of vehicle that has the attributes number of wheels and registration date. Due to inheritance, land vehicle will inherit every single attribute from vehicle. However, if you notice, a land vehicle doesn't have an altitude, so it inherits an attribute that it never uses. Alternatively, we could restructure the class diagram so that it looks like this. We now know that a land vehicle doesn't require a max altitude, but an air vehicle does. So in this case, we have added a new subclass called air vehicle and moved the max altitude attribute from vehicle down to air vehicle. Also notice that the registration date attribute has been duplicated. And in fact, if you think about it, every vehicle should have a registration date. So an even better design would be something like this. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Interaction coupling refers to the number of message types an object sends to another object, as well as the number of parameters within these messages. So if one object sends many messages to another object, or it sends messages with lots of parameters, then these two objects tend to be tightly coupled. Here's an example of two objects that are tightly coupled due to the number of parameters. We see that the registration object sends a message that has five parameters to customer. So the registration and the customer object are considered tightly coupled. Here's another example. The receipts class has four operations. The add DVD operation takes a parameter of type DVD. Add CD takes in a CD. Add game takes in a game and add delivery takes in an object of type delivery. This means that the receipts class needs to know about all four of these classes. And UML allows us to reflect that using the use association. But if you think about it, when you add a DVD to a receipt, all you're really doing is adding the price of the DVD to the receipt. So what the receipts class actually requires is only the price. Knowing this, is there a better way to configure this class diagram? Here's a better alternative. Instead of having four different operations of add item for the four different types of items, we have a single operation called add priced item, which takes as its parameter an object of type priced item. So what is priced item? Is it simply a superclass and the other four objects are subclasses of it? Well, that might work, but there may be a more elegant solution. Let's make priced item an interface. And what an interface basically says is that it provides an operation called getPrice. And the various other classes can implement this interface. You've learned about interface in your object oriented programming courses. Here's a quick refresher on what is an interface. An interface in UML is a group of public operations, and this is functionally equivalent to an abstract class with no associations and only abstract operations. If you recall, you can never instantiate an abstract class, and all abstract operations must be re-implemented by classes that implement the interface. There are actually two ways to represent interfaces in UML. The first way is simply as a stereotyped class. So in this case, we have the receipts class that uses an interface called price item. And we know that price item is an interface due to this interface stereotype. The second way to represent interfaces in UML is what is known as the ball and socket notation. So what's a ball and socket notation? We have a class that makes use of an interface, and the interface is represented by a ball. 
So if this interface is called well interface, then we label it like so. The ones the classes that implement the interface uses a socket. And this is a notation like this. So in this case, the equivalent of the receipt and price item structure would be like this. Now, bear in mind that usually in one diagram, you either use the stereotype class or the ball and socket notation to represent interfaces. Here are some final thoughts. Good cohesion and coupling makes it easier to do several things. Firstly, it's easier to locate where to make changes when required. That's because a single class or a single component only has one responsibility. So if we want to make a change for a particular responsibility, we know exactly where to look. It is also easier to make changes without affecting other components because they are loosely coupled. Finally, if we have good cohesion and coupling, we can logically divide the components to allow different teams to work on them independently. Now bear in mind, cohesion and coupling are not mutually exclusive. Good systems can have both high cohesion and low coupling. On the other hand, there is a limit to maximizing cohesion and minimizing coupling. In the extreme example, every single attribute can be considered a class, and that would maximize the cohesion and minimize the coupling. But that would create a very huge class diagram that serves no real purpose. Incidentally, you see this letter? That is the fifth letter of the password. And that's all we have for cohesion and coupling. Thanks for watching. In our next lesson, we will talk about how to design associations. Would you like some fries with that?